Good morning, and thank you for joining today's webinar, the first in the Revitalizing Ohio's Brownfields webinar series. My name is Erin Clapper. I'm a senior project manager at the Greater Ohio Policy Center. GOPC launched the Revitalizing Ohio's Brownfields initiative with an online platform, ohiobrownfields.com, following the establishment of the Brownfields Remediation Fund and the state's biennium operating budget earlier this year. For the first time in more than a decade, Ohio's communities will have access to grant dollars to tackle brownfields that blight their communities and hinder development efforts. This initiative is designed to provide the tools and resources for those seeking to remediate and redevelop brownfields in Ohio and serve as an educational resource. Just yesterday, the initiative launched an online directory of experts to connect local change makers with brownfields experts. Ohio's newly created Brownfield Remediation Fund holds great possibilities for local communities. However, local government staff and elected officials may be unsure of where and how to begin preparing to apply for and utilize those Brownfield Remediation Funds. We're so excited to host today's webinar, which will hopefully provide you with an overview of what it takes to see a Brownfield through from start to finish and the importance of planning and prioritizing now in hopes of ensuring success in applying for and utilizing grant dollars that will soon be available at the state level. The launch of the OhioBrownfields.com website, as well as the educational tools and resources in part made possible through the initiative sponsors. I'd like to go through and recognize those sponsors now. At the platinum level, we have the Manic and Smith Group, as well as HZW Environmental Consultants, Civil and Environmental Consultants Incorporated, CEC. At our gold sponsorship level, we have Hemisphere Brownfield Group, SME, and Tucker Ellis, LLP. Silver sponsor level, we have Terracon and Partners Environmental. And at a bronze sponsorship level, we have Thrive Company, Brooker and Eckler, uh, TRC, and Environmental Remediation Contractor, ERC. A special thanks to today's Platinum sponsor of the webinar, Hall & Associates. Uh, additional information, including contact information for each of these sponsor organizations can be found on ohiobrownfield.com. Before we get started and jump in, I did wanna take a moment and introduce our panelists that we'll have today. We have Craig Casper, Executive Vice President of Hall & Associates, Sarah Lone, a public finance manager at Western Reserve Port Authority. David Ebersall, the director of economic development with the city of Cleveland. And Jeffrey Harris, a public financing attorney at Brooker and Eckler LLP. Uh, before we do jump in and, and I kick it over to our panelists to go over uh, their presentations, I wanted to address some, a few housekeeping items. Um, we have def defaulted participants to be with uh, in mute mode and uh, without video. Um, we ask that you keep that off to avoid distractions and any questions or issues, please submit through the chat box. Um, there'll be a Q&A period at the end in the last 15 or so minutes. Questions that you have can be submitted through the chat box and we'll get those uh, addressed and, and answered. And uh, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on ohiobrownfields.com along with the slides that were shared today. So with that, I'm pleased to turn over the reins to Craig Casper of Holland Associates to give us a kind of a background and overview and get us started today. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, well, uh, hello everyone. I'm glad you joined the, the webinar. Um, it's nice to see all those sponsors are the same firms that were working on this program 20 years ago. So I, I guess we, uh, we must enjoy Brownfield. So that's, that's, that's good to see that. Um, yeah, just real quick, uh, Holland Associates, uh, if you don't know us, we're, we're at Ohio Ohio-born firm. I'm a Cleveland native and live in Columbus now. John Hall started the company in 1980. Um, and uh, we, we have grown, um, you know, our focus is environment, water, infrastructure, and energy. We've changed through the years. It's been a, that's what you can do over after 30 years. I've been there since uh, 1989. And, um, and recently we've made some acquisitions nationally and we, we've grown to about 500 people and which is interesting because it's really neat to see how some of our new firms look at brownfields versus we do. And that, that's with that, I'll kind of jump into, you know, what I think we have in Ohio. I, I think it's, I'm not saying it because I'm an Ohioan, a Browns fan, an Indians fan. We have got the best uh, brownfield program, I think, in the country. If you take everything into account, our cleanup program, how long we've been doing it, 
funding. We have a lot of great tools. And, and here again, now this, you know, Governor DeWine has come out with another funding program, again, really important for communities to be able to redevelop these sites. So I, you know, I, I, I done a couple of webinars with Aaron and I thought I'd talk a little bit about the history um, when I say that the program has a lot of foundation. Um, in 1994, then Governor Voinovich and Betty Montgomery, uh, Attorney General, came, came up with the Ohio Voluntary Action Program legislation. And um, I was on that steering committee 27 years ago when we started that. And um, it is a very unique program. It's cleaned up a lot of sites. Um, it's become very, very efficient through the years. And again, I'm comparing this not just to itself, I'm comparing that to other, other programs I see around the country. And then in 2002, um, then Governor Taft, uh, Representative Chuck Blaisdell at the time came up with the first Clean Ohio Fund. And that was uh, $200 million for Brownfields, $200 million for Greenfield, which is just was ingenious to do it that way. And that project, that, that program ran for 13 years. It levered a lot of private investment, cleaned up hundreds of sites, uh, both for, for you know, reuse as commercial, industrial, residential sites, as well as conservation, energy. Um, so there's been a lot of really cool projects because of that fund. And then um, now we're getting a little sooner, maybe some of you are a little newer, Jobs Ohio took the program over in 2013 and they, they kept a completely strong, robust program. We've worked with them on several, several projects. They take a, a very a developer, user, you know, job um, creation type of view. Um, they've been very helpful, not just on the brownfield side, but on infrastructure, entitlements, so they've, they've just done a great job and it's, it, glad to still, still have them involved. And then now we have this new program that I think, you know, I know Aaron worked on it for a long time. I, I did. I bet you many other people on the phone did as far as talking to legislators and writing opinions and comments. And um, I was actually kind of surprised when it, when it showed up the way it did. And I think everyone was pretty happy. And, you know, you'll hear more details on this, but we have $500 million dollars. Um, which is a lot of money. And it's, it's more than any program that I'm aware of as far as grant dollars in the country right now. And actually, if you look at the, the new um, infrastructure bill, which is 21 billion for the whole country, and that's really for Superfund sites, it really doesn't help Brownfields. We have one of the best funding programs uh, in the country once again. And um, so we should be excited about that and pat ourselves on the back. And I really hope there's a lot of communities, uh, there's a lot of experienced communities on this call and a lot of communities that they'll have an opportunity to look at their brownfields and, and maybe they didn't do it in the Clean Ohio Fund one of the last couple of years, but it's certainly being promoted to use it throughout the state. So that's that's great. With that one, you know, just quickly, one difference between this program and Clean Ohio or even working with Jobs Ohio is it's a fast program, right? It's 350 million for brownfields and 150 million for demolition. And it's gonna be allocated in two years, uh, the length of the budget. And then you can spend it after that, but once it's gone, it's gone. And, you know, we don't know if there's going to be another pot. You know, Clean Ohio went for 11 years of, of um, having the, the, the fund replenished and, and, and projects started. So it's important to know that. And what you'll hear from maybe the speakers today or future uh, web, uh, webinars is you really have to know what you, you have to be ready because it is going to be fast. The application, if it comes out in December, um, people are going to want to apply um, to do their project. So number one, the first thing is knowing what your project is. Um, what, what, what's, what is in your community that has been something you've wanted cleaned up or redeveloped for years and haven't done it? And this slide right here, um, I think it's important that, you know, people think of brownfields. They think of all the auto plants that closed in 2008 and steel mills and, you know, large facilities. Um, but they take all, all kinds of shapes. The corner gas station. The corner gas station doesn't have a building and was a corner gas station. I mean, so brownfields, you know, the, the, the EPA definition um, seems like they're, you know, larger and they're complicated by perceived or real um, environmental uh, impairment or conditions. They're really something in your community that has some type of impairment, some type of issue, you know, per acre, sometimes the smaller ones are tougher to deal with. So anyway, know your project. Um, and then think about what you want to do with it. So if you go to the next slide real quick for me, Aaron, please. I mean, everyone hears about the new plant, you know, or a casino. We have two casinos on Brownfields in, in Ohio, um, but a cancer treatment center down there on the lower left in Springfield, Ohio, who did an, does, has an amazing Brownfield redevelopment program in their urban core. That was a catalyst for a brand new hospital, medical office buildings. I mean, their end use was a lot different than someone else's. 
The one in the lower right is, uh, is a project we just finished up and it's going to be um, a conservation park um, with paths and everything else that's the best use. It's cleaned up and, and then the one up top is a solar field on, on an old landfill uh, that we put a solar field in. So be creative on your uses. There's a lot of things that, that you, you, can, uh, you can turn a brownfield into and there's every community has a brownfield um, at, at some level and that's what was the previous slide. So I'll pass it on, but one thing that, again, I, I just want to, um, it's really important to be ready. So get your stakeholders involved, understand which project you want, what's your priority, what can you do with it, and, you know, try to understand it. You're going to have to access that property, who owns it, who's, I mean, you probably know that, but it's really important to get as much information as you can, and you should be doing that now, because when the application comes out, that's the type of thing it's going to ask for. So Again, we have a great program. This is really exciting. Um, there's a lot of experience in this state, as you saw from the sponsors and the panelists here. Um, so there's a lot of people around to help you get your project done. So um, excited and good luck to all of you that decide to redevelop a brownfield in your community. And with that, I'll pass it on to Sarah. Thanks, Craig. It's great to have that background and, and great to hear about um, the opportunities that we've had over the past few decades and also now what we have coming ahead with the Brownfield Remediation Fund. So we'll kick it over to Sarah up in the Mahoney Valley. Thank you, Aaron. And good morning, folks. Aaron, I wanna thank you for inviting me here to share my experience with you all today. And Craig, um, I have known and enjoyed the benefit of your services from Holland Associates many times. And hearing from you reminds me of the first maxim of brownfield revitalization, get a good environmental consultant. And then the rest is just detail. And here I go now with detail. First, let me share a bit about my experience. I came to Youngstown, Ohio from the Boston area in the mid 1990s. And I looked around and like Betty Davis, if you remember Betty Davis, I had to say, what a mess. Youngstown and the cities adjacent to Youngstown were peppered with abandoned industrial properties, old mills, boarded up office buildings, and the downtown looked like it was bombed out. And when I was looking for work, I was lucky enough to find a job as general grant writer and then within a couple of years, the Clean Ohio program came along, again, thanks to Craig and all the hard work in developing such a wonderful program. Uh, and it enabled us to focus a bit um, on the brownfields. And during the height of the Clean Ohio program, our community undertook what, what I'm calling a kind of a wholesale brownfield remediate, remediation program we came together and we cleaned up 25 brownfield sites over a period of about 11 to 12 years. Uh, we secured about 15 million in Clean Ohio funds. Uh, we prepared ourselves for every cycle of the revitalization fund that, that we possibly could. And then we also secured another six or seven US EPA grants, uh, totaling um, about 20 million in invested funds from the state and federal government for assessment and remediation in the area. And now really, I'm happy to say this place is no longer the poster child for urban rust belt blight. Um, we, we really have cleaned up our act and it's exciting. Um, and now I, I just wanna share uh, some of the particulars about how we went about accomplishing that. Next slide, thank you, Aaron. Um, you can see from this map how the preponderance of brownfield sites sit along the Mahoning River corridor. Um, the river is that gray line that sort of looks like an economic indicator in recent years. First it goes north, then it goes south. That's our river there. Uh, and then the green rings along that river corridor indicate the areas where there's a concentration of brownfields. Um, those brownfields represent largely the steel industry, which was once active uh, and when they uh, left the region, we were left with brownfields that began to ripple out in the central business districts and affect all layers of life here in the Mahoning Valley. Uh, once we were the third largest producing steel area in the, in the world, uh, this was after the post-World War II period. 
Uh, and then suddenly on September 17th, um, the mills began to close. And eventually we saw the loss of 100,000 good paying jobs um, and true economic devastation for the area. And uh, one of the more challenging side effects of that economic devastation uh, is how much it left the community politically and socially fragmented. Um, one jurisdiction would compete against another for limited brownfield resources or whatever was available uh, to get back on our feet. And, and we eventually gained the reputation both in Columbus and Washington, DC, uh, that we were always fighting amongst ourselves. We couldn't get our act together. Uh, you know, we wanna help you, but you guys have to agree on how we can help you. Um, so we, we did as best we could, we got our act together. And it started with a group that included mayors, um, city planners from different cities, university and community leaders, our metropolitan planning organization. Um, they all started by inventorying and characterizing the brownfield sites. Uh, and once Clean Ohio was in place, we were now prepared with a project for each round of the revitalization funding and for a steady flow of assistance funding. Uh, in recent years, that inventory has gone fallow. And, and thanks to Rachel McCartney, who's here today from YSU, uh, she's resurrected this inventory that we had previously, and she's been building on that. Um, she's as assembled the uh, um, land banks and the local MPO and other folks, uh, regional chamber to make input on uh, the new brownfield inventory that we're bringing together. Um, and beyond that, we're working on a set of prioritizing the brownfields, um, but really there are two, for all of your communities, there are two non-negotiable priorities. Number one, you must own or somehow control the site. You have to have a willing property owner. And sometimes, especially with those industrial sites, um, it's, it can be dicey. Uh, so make sure you have control of the site. And then the second is you really want to have infrastructure in and around the site to provide for access. Uh, you're, you might have to dust it off and improve it, but infrastructure, utilities, these are key things uh, to help you succeed in the redevelopment process. Um, and if you get to those things, you're going to save yourself a lot of headaches down the road. All right, next slide, please. Thank you, Aaron. All right, well, creating <coughs> Brownfields inventory, if you've ever done it, you'll find that it's dull, very dull, and it's lacking in controversy, which is great. Uh, what it enables your community to do is bring competing parties to the table and agree upon sites. Just get a list, slap it down, get a list. Eventually, this is the sort of thing that helps build the kind of community infrastructure that you need, and we were able to build. And uh, it's really kind of continued to operate till today. Uh, back in the day, one of the mayors, his name was Dan Mamula from Struthers. He helped bring together uh, the Mahoning River Mayors Association. And that is pictured here in this little photo. Uh, it includes mayors from all the cities where the steel mills and other heavy industry was concentrated largely up and down the Mahoning River corridor. Uh, this, this group continues to meet quarterly um, and they continue to lobby for brownfield funding, among other things. Uh, since the Mayor's Association started, we're lucky enough to gain the support from local business leaders who have friends in high places. And here you see in the photo, we were able to bring the governor to town for a conversation with the mayors. And guess what? They talked to the governor about brownfields. And this was tremendously helpful in bringing our urban concerns to the attention of the administration uh, and helping set statewide priorities on the behalf of that. If you're able to do it in your community, step right in the ring, it helps. Further, uh, Eastgate Regional Council of Governments, our local MPO, um, convenes something that we call the Mahoning River Corridor Initiative, lousy name, because it, it doesn't stand for anything, the acronym it doesn't work, but it's a group of economic development professionals, community leaders, stakeholders, uh, 
a, a blend of folks, and they're helping to promote kind of a three-pronged approach to community development. First, economic development, job creation. Second, recreational options for the communities. And then last, conservation activities along the river corridor uh, to bring about a kind of blended revitalization scenario aimed at improving the quality of life for residents going out 50 years. Between the mayor's group and the group of professionals comprising the corridor initiative, this is a community input infrastructure that can set priorities and help drive development. It's no, not a perfect solution. It's not always going to be what you use. Cities are always going to look out for their own interests. They're going to have to set priorities. Suddenly, a corporation is going to drop into town and want a site. And you're going to have to drop all of your lists and your priorities and your standards. And, and so you're always going to want to be flexible. Uh, but if you've got the community input structure in place, uh, the trust is built and there's support for your project. Uh, and also it beats scrambling around trying to get community input on the last minute to check off a box on a grant proposal. Uh, and I think a lot of us have been there in the past. All right, next slide, please, Aaron. Thank you. You may have noticed how with community input discussions within the community often highlight these various competing interests in public meetings where input is elicited from citizens. There are always calls for more parks, bike trails, and recreational spaces. In meetings with mayors and economic development professionals, there are always calls to create more jobs. A couple of years ago, when I revisited the brownfields we got remediated, it surprised me how many turned out to be recreational or open spaces uh, on those sites. Um, and this highlights a big challenge attached to brownfields in our town and probably also in your town. Industries rarely step forward to partner in remediation. Um, and they often are not willing to wait for government to clean a site so they can locate operations there. Uh, there's still too many obstacles and, and hurdles. I think we're getting better, but we're a little ways away. I hope someday those hurdles will become streamlined and the inducement will be too good to pass out for industry, uh, but we're, we're not quite there yet. In the meantime, I would say we, we need to trust our process. When the community wants parks and open spaces and recreation, make it happen. Uh, it's still valuable in many ways. A few years ago, um, when, when I got a US EPA grant to assess properties up in Trumbull County, um, we set aside a little of that money and we hired an intern to do some research because, and I really think it was Greater Ohio, uh, had some studies done that said brownfields reduce property values by 20% um, surrounding the brownfield, but also a good mile out from that brownfield. So we had this intern take a look at 24 sites in the two counties, half of them brownfields, half of them thriving industries. And lo and behold, it was about a 20% devaluation as a result of a blighted property. It was a great project for her. Uh, it led to a master's um, scholarship for her and it was cited on a lot of other locations. And um, it, it was also very valuable for us in the business community to make that um, hardcore argument that sometimes you need to make. Um, so no matter what you do on that site, if you clean it up, it builds value and that's important. Last slide, please, Aaron. Thank you. I don't think I'm overstating it. Some of the work that you do on brownfields is the most important work you can do for the community. Not only are you revitalizing the cities, but in many cases, you're preserving the farmlands. You're preventing deforestation. Maybe you're, re you're reducing commute times for working families and on and on. Ohio, um, as I drive around the state, I see it's, it's such an interesting proving ground for all of this. Um, you see sprawl and it's hard to combat. Um, but here in this picture that you see, um, this was a, a vision for an amphitheater that was built on one of our bigger and more visible brownfields. Um, 
and it came out so well. It really has become a destination and sort of the heart and soul of the city in some ways. Now, when I was cleaning up that site, I really wanted to have a new industry there. I really wanted to create jobs. I was lost that battle, so it goes. And now I realize, of course, I was dead wrong. This was a much better use for that site. In the end, what you might find is that working with planners, residents, public officials, stakeholders, you'll arrive at a blend kind of an integration of industry, commercial, recreation, and conservation. And, and that's a good thing. When I entered the field of economic development, the emphasis was primarily on offering industry incentives to locate in your community. And it was about taxes and throwing money and offering free land and everything. And now you see us moving into an approach uh, that, that's oriented more around quality of life um, as an, a natural inducement to industry. Um, these are both good things. Cities are more active now and it's wonderful to see we have a group of young folks who are really pursuing a creative mixed use strategy in our communities and, and bringing stronger expression to the character of the community that's already there. Uh, and it's exciting. And even when you're in the middle of working on it, it feels like drudgery. But in 10 years, you see that you remove the blight and it's exciting for yourself and the next generation. And this is great. So we only hope we can keep those funds flowing from the state. It's the best tool that we have. And now I will relinquish my Zoom square to Aaron so you can hear more about Brownfields with a deeper dive into Cleveland and all of the work David is doing over there. All the best of, to you and in your efforts to revitalize. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for that perspective. It's great to hear, but we will kick it over to David and we'll hear what's going on in Cleveland. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody, for um, uh, coming on today and, and really appreciate seeing you here. Let me, uh, my, there we go. All right. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what uh, what goals we want to have with um, brownfield redevelopment when we're looking at um, uh, projects, site assembly, and, and how you would prioritize them from a municipal perspective. And I'm going to talk um, in a minute about a couple of infrastructure corridors that we tried to build off of. Um, but first, before we get into the, the examples, just some big picture thoughts. Um, Brownfields, um, certainly in a city like Cleveland, and I think in, in many cities um, or, or communities, um, you, you have areas where you have concentrated brownfield challenges, right? And so whether it's um, in an industrial district, whether it's um, a couple uh, in, in a smaller community, a couple of the long historic manufacturing uh, entities that maybe the town grew up around, um, or uh, a rail corridor or, or, or an infrastructure corridor where uh, industries grow along, grew up along. So you, you have these, these areas, these districts. Um, and when you're, when you're, you could pick up a brownfield site pretty much anywhere, right? I mean, you could, so you wanna be strategic in thinking about how focusing your brownfield redevelopment focuses on, um, development opportunities and investment opportunities. So I think two things to consider about, and we're gonna see them and touch on them in examples is, where are you seeing infrastructure investments? Where do you have opportunities to leverage off of um, major investments in your community? And where do you have anchors or opportunities? So whether it's a, um, a, a, new, uh, a new industry or an, an area, a neighborhood of strength or a, um, New park or or facility of, of some sort like that. Where 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 can you start building off of uh, development interest rather than just sort of trying to create something from scratch? I think you can. It's easier to make a sale if you want to put it that way. Um, ideally, you should have some short term and long term goals. So you you should have sites um, that are perhaps already cleaned up or may have just a little bit of um, 
uh, brownfield issues that you have to address, and then you have longer term um, strategies that uh, you have sites that are uh, require a significant amount of remediation or may, may be more difficult to get and, and pull together and assemble. Um, and so you're thinking about when you're thinking about that, you're thinking about what you can do to get momentum going in, in years one, two of your agenda, and then think about where things fall five years, 10 years out. Um, that ties to thinking about assembly. Where do you have land? Are you working in um, areas where you have a predominantly residential district that may be being converted over to a um, uh, more industrial district? Um, do you have an area that's historically industrial and you're you're trying to uh, assemble properties um, which may have um, uh, industrial use or may have it may be a um, uh, if you're looking at uh, something where you have a facility that is recently abandoned by a large corporation. So we've had uh, sites that I've worked on that have been abandoned by First Energy, have been abandoned by ArcelorMittal, have been abandoned by General Electric. And so as you um, large industrial users or industrial companies are often willing to dispose of their brownfield sites, but they have a lot of uh, rules and, and, and internal processes by which they will do that. And so how do you have to work through that? Um, and think about what you own already. You know, do you have sites that have come into the city through foreclosure, through abandonment, through through um, land banking and so forth. And finally, when you think about your brownfield challenges, what do you know? And then what do you know that you don't know? And you know, if you've done any brownfield sites, you know that there's always a third group, the unknown unknowns, but you can't plan around those. They're unknown unknowns for a reason, but you can plan a little bit around what your known issues are and what you know you don't know and, and start thinking about how you can move items from unknowns into knowns. So um, moving forward, a couple examples. Um, Cleveland's Health Tech Corridor. Um, so if we look at the, the next slide, that's that's the development along the, um, if you've been to Cleveland along Euclid Avenue, where in uh, the mid 2000s, they put forward uh, through RTA, the Transit Authority and the, and the um, Department of Transportation, federal and, and state level, completely redid Euclid Avenue, put in a bus rapid transit line that connected downtown and university circle. So you connected the two largest employment centers within the city. Um, and you're connecting them through the, the Midtown area where there was a significant amount of vacancy, a significant amount of rundown dilapidated buildings and needed demolition. And if you look at the, the impact, this, this we started in about 2007, 2008, pulling these um, properties together. There was a lot of Clean Ohio money that went into this corridor um, between uh, public financing that the city put together, um, Clean Ohio and, and other um, projects, we've put almost $100 million into this area over the last 10 years or so, um, and uh, invest, drawn over a billion dollars of, of private investment. You've seen the results, the huge increase in property value, huge increase in jobs. Um, next slide. So this is what it looked like in 2007. You can see the road uh, just starting to come in. You can see some of the medians that are being built out. You can see a lot of uh, built a lot of vacant land, a lot of buildings that uh, you can see from the map are in, in poor condition and, and open. Um, my favorite building is this like reverse L-shaped building um, towards the uh, middle of the map where uh, RTA uh, and, and when they undertook the project had to acquire uh, that property to expand the road and they ripped off like the front 20 feet of the building and left the rest of the building standing there um, open for the for the elements while they built the road. So not not great long term thinking by the uh, the road engineers, which um, if there's any road engineers on the phone, um, I apologize, but uh, tends to be something you see in these infrastructure uh, uh, investments. Uh, the the engineering doesn't necessarily match the future development. So moving forward. Uh, next on the next slide, you see kind of where we're where we're at today. And so this is this really the same stretch of land, and you can see uh, the about uh, dozens of investments that have come in and or are being um, brought in in that area. So um, uh, nine new office buildings, over a million square feet of space, um, new construction, renovation. Um, 
foundation, the Cleveland Foundation is moving there. Magnet is a local manufacturing nonprofit moving in there. We had a grocery store, we have a hotel. So it's a really robust mix of, um, of uh, projects benefiting both um, sort of the businesses that are there and, and, and bringing in new businesses as well. Um, and if you if you were to look at those um, those sites, the current site where um, uh, the University Hospitals Rainbow Center and Link 59 and the, the Days Market there, those three large parcels on the west, which is sort of the bottom corner of the of the diagram there, um, those were uh, all Clean Ohio projects. Um, there was a three million dollar Clean Ohio grant there. We got two million dollars of brownfield money from the federal government. Um, uh, to go into further cleaning up that site, um, that was a it had a a groundwater issue of of real a real challenge um, uh, in that area. So that's that's one site. Um, the Midtown Tech sites, which are in sort of the other corner up towards the, the northeast, um, uh, were uh, similar brownfield sites. Um, the Dealer Tire was an old empty uh, building that. Uh, we uh, got, I think, job ready site money, um, another speaking of other programs that no longer exist um, to uh, be put in there. And so, um, but this is a 10 year, this is a 10 year program. So um, moving moving on, cause I know I'm starting to run a little bit over where we're working on now, Opportunity Corridor, um, next slide. So that's ODOT um, in the mid 2000s, mid 2010s, started construction on a uh, boulevard to uh, connect where I-490 terminates at I-77 in Cleveland up into University Circle. So again, connecting the in, in interstate system to, a, to an anchor uh, of employment and development. Um, we negotiated as part of that $10 million from Jobs Ohio for Brownfield Assessment Remediation, um, worked with the uh, Community Development Partnership to um, acquire properties and, and to implement development opportunities. And right now we're just uh, starting to close out the brownfield work and, and get some of these projects going. Um, next slide. And so if you look here, you know, in this area, you've got a, a broader mix. You have some pro pro properties that are uh, really consolidating of former residential areas that were predominantly abandoned. And I mean, you look at these some of these sites that are 15 acre sites and there were maybe five houses in the whole entirety of the, the site. But then you also have industrial properties as you move to the north and um, then head into University Circle. So moving next slide. Um, and so as the road was going in and they just did the ribbon cutting a week ago, we uh, undertook uh, site assessments on all these major parcels, phase one sites, phase two sites, recognizing that while we couldn't get onto every single site, we'd be able to at least get a pretty good idea of what's going on and, and try to tackle some of those, figure out what some of the things we don't know are, um, and position those sites for, for redevelopment. And so now here we, we've got um, assessment strategies, we've got funding in place for remediation, and we've got sites lined up. So as, as you're thinking about how you might take advantage of some of the new programming that's, that's going out there, this is kind of the uh, example I would give of a four or five year plan that you started at the beginning, pulled the sites together, got the information, teed them up, and now are ready to go. So um, next slide. I think that's the last one. Yep, there we are. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to your questions. Thanks, David and Sarah. The perspectives that you give are great for uh, folks on the call to hear. And we'll kick it over to Jeff Harris from Brooker and Eckler. And Jeff's going to give a little bit of a perspective on, I guess, a checklist on things that local change makers and communities can start thinking of as, as they're um, going through the processes that like you and Sarah, uh, David and Sarah have identified. So I'll kick it over to you, Jeff. Great. And thanks, Aaron. If you could go to the next slide for me. And while, uh, while Aaron's doing that, a couple introductory thoughts. Um, I'm at Bricker and Eckler, a law firm uh, based out of Columbus, but we are in uh, all the major markets in, in, in Ohio. And uh, I'm in the public finance group and most of my work focuses on uh, county land bank work, as well as all those uh, evil incentives that Sarah had mentioned uh, earlier in this call that uh, it, we would entice or we, we help clients entice new development in, into their respective jurisdictions. It's still a, a, a dirty world, right? So everybody's doing it, still has to respond. Clients still call us and say, how do I structure these deals to get a new industrial or retail 
or even residential developer into my area. And that's where we come in. Um, David actually made a call out. He didn't know it, but I cut my teeth and maybe some of you are booing or hissing me if you see my name. Uh, I was uh, the job ready site uh, guy for the early part of my career. And I love it that what 15 years later, I see these things actually coming online and, and getting some development interest. Um, Cause I know we took some we took some heat when that thing first came out under the Taft administration. And, and there's probably some of you on this call still think it was a dumb program, but I had I have a soft spot. Um, a few things. If you've noticed, careful listeners, each of the presenters so far, including me, uh, doubled down on the idea of site ownership. And anytime we get into economic development, uh, community development, you know, you can have the best idea possible as to what you think or what the community planner thinks should happen on a site. But if you don't have site control, uh, like as I've been burned in my career, you could have a great idea and it just languishes and then somebody else comes in and develops it in an entirely different, perhaps not even uh, a, a highest and best use purpose. So site ownership is a key thing. The other thing before getting into my remarks is Sarah had mentioned the idea of inventorying brownfields. And I just wanna make sure I call attention to everybody uh, that Senate Bill 83, currently under consideration and now in the House, it's passed the Senate unanimously, but Senate Bill 83 has money, not a lot, but money for Ohio EPA to inventory every brownfield in Ohio. So whereas right now it's a voluntary inventory, a library is somewhat uh, 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 maybe stark, depending on who chooses to report or not, Senate Bill 83 would put money out there for an inventory process. Uh, so all those things aside, Aaron, could you go to the next slide for me? I'm going to talk, be talking about everybody's favorite phrase for the last 10 years, right? Which is, is the site shovel ready? And as I have here as our introductory or our, our preamble, it's, it's, it's a joke, but it's real. Hey, you've done the, the cleanup, but now really the work begins. And where Sarah had said so many of the brownfields we've seen in our careers have gone recreational, outdoor recreation, or what have you, my comments, you'll, you can tell within about three seconds here, are really devoted to those brownfields that are remediated, that then remain in the, uh, in the market for commercial industrial purposes. So um, all that said, when we think about those sites, whether they're the gas station Craig talked about, uh, at the outset, or even dry cleaners, right? I was shocked when I was at the Ohio Department of Development how dirty dry cleaners are, which is why I don't use dry cleaning anymore. Sorry, anybody who owns a dry cleaning business. But you see from those small corner lots, the gas stations and the dry cleaners, all the way through the massive industrial sites, um, you need to know everything there is need to know about that site post brownfield. Um, and having gone through the brownfield process, whatever shape that takes when ODOD finally drops their rules in the, in the uh, JCAR process, the Joint Committee on Agency Rule Review, when they come out uh, from Department of Development, whatever form that those rules take, whether they look a lot like CORF or they look like something new, going through that process, spending down that $350 million, the million dollars that's allocated directly to your county, um, if you're in a public sector environment, that will get you to most of the pieces I've got here as far as checklist items that you need to have in place when you go back to market. Going through the brownfield process, you're going to know the site owner. And in fact, from the other comments for Craig, Sarah, and David, you may be the site owner, right? If you're local government or you're county government, you're probably the owner of last resort. But certainly ownership and knowledge of ownership and know, knowing exactly where the chain of title is, having all that buttoned up is a huge thing when we think about going back out to the market with your site. Knowing who your utilities are, knowing their capacities, having the utility partners at the table when you start trying to drive a developer interest in a site is hugely important, as well as your key and tie into the Jobs Ohio, uh, the, the Regional Economic Development Organization Network, or what they call the RIDOs, so that your site, not only do you have the site cleaned up now, but you're starting to lay out who are all the partners, how are we going to get that site redeveloped and moving quickly because the private sector is, as I think Sarah mentioned, extremely demanding. They typically don't want to wait around for your altruistic uh, remediation plan to take effect in nine years. They want to know where's that site, where's my water taps. Um, I'm moving on this and it's either you or the next community over, or if they're really savvy, they'll say, well, I'm also looking at Michigan or Indiana, which then ding, it 
it now chimes in Jobs Ohio to get involved. Most of the sophisticated partners, they know that. They're going to tell you they're looking at Pennsylvania, Kentucky, or Indiana, because then it gets that next level of incentives, going back to Sarah's dirty word, right? Um, Sarah, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I, 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 caught, I caught some of that uh, from your comments. So, but more importantly, and I saw this uh, throughout my career, you may have the world's best site. Who knows about it? And if nobody knows about it, you may have a site that just looks really good as a uh, future development site. So is the site loaded up on Jobs Ohio's online searchable tool and their online portal? Um, who's the point of contact? Do you have that clearly demonstrated in that cleaned up sites online information that hopefully, again, you've posted online to Jobs Ohio and other network partners, including um, Coinstar and some of those other listing services. Next slide, Aaron. Again, uh, it's the real work is here, right? So do you know that site inside and out? If you've gone through your brownfield process, if you've worked with folks like Craig, and, and if you've worked with local economic developers like David, you're gonna know your site pretty darn well. Be able to recite it from memory, you know, almost like throw the specs out at a developer as he or she is touring the site to say, I've, yeah, I've got, this is the acreage, uh, this is the developable acreage, you know, here's where your electric, lines come in, here's where your water taps are, but then also have all of your local financing lined up. So either like a port authority where Sarah works or, or some of your other financing options, have everything lined up, ready to go. Do you have an enterprise zone or community reinvestment area that not only encompasses the site or captures the site, but then you also have the, uh, the city or the county has said, yes, we were willing to, to, to support the project in this way under our enterprise zone program, and we're ready to rock and roll. Are you gonna make use of tax increment financing? Do you know which TIF you wanna use? Do you know it would be the county running it or the city or a township? Do you have your terms of the exemption in place, at least in your head, ready to go on a term sheet? When the developer says, I am interested in your remediated brownfield, I do wanna build there, but I need incentives. Are you prepared to, and have you already worked out a relationship with the local port? Uh, like Sarah's outfit, uh, so there's a lot of very active ports all over how they're extremely sophisticated. They know exactly how to do this stuff. And if you bring them in, you can also get exemptions on sales tax for construction materials. And then finally, do you have more localized uh, uh, deliverables on the shelf ready to go? Do you have a development agreement that you could load in a, a developer or an end user into the development agreement that lays out the terms of what you're willing to provide them to get them to come onto that site, including maybe even capital leases or other structures that get a little funny, but they make total sense to the right sophisticated partner. Next, next slide, Aaron. And then it's just all the uh, all the, the the aspects of the site that I have found over my career. The developers, the end users, just want somebody in the room to say, "I know what you need. Here's the information, and I've got it in my three ring binder." What's the address? Where's the site? What's the zoning? Is it currently zoning? And if the developer has to come in, does it have, does it need a zoning variance or does it have to be rezoned? Uh, it goes back to Sarah's comment that some folks don't want to wait around for your zoning, uh, rezoning hearing. Um, uh, what's your electric service capacity? How many, how many interruptions are there occurring at that site on an annual basis? Uh, if you get two or more, it starts making developers feel kind of funny. Uh, then they have, they have they have to get into uh, uh, you know on-site redundancy, right? What's your water and sewer capacities at the site? Can you recite them from memory? When's the last time you measured your your sewer and water systems overall capacity and their their overage or, or their uh, surplus capacity? Uh, where are all these things laid out at the actual physical location of the site? Again, all my comments going to industrial commercial reuse. Obviously, I would imagine a local park district could care less about some of these things to Sarah's comment that a lot of these may go recreational. Um, a du nice duck pond, the ducks and the geese, they could, care, they could care a whit about how far it is from the local service or substation. But uh, the uh, potential uh, arc furnace that you're trying to land may have a real interest in that. Next slide, Aaron. And this is my last slide to my to my recollection. Um, and then all the other things that go into your knowledge of that site. Where is it in relation to the world? How far away is rail access? 
How far away is the airport, particularly your international airport? How do you get to the airport? If you get to the airport, that's an international access only by two lane road. Uh, you're going to start to see frowny faces when you're trying to show these sites to developers and, and international or multi state end users. Where's your interstate access and your state highway access? How far away? How many traffic lights? Can they handle truck traffic? And then finally, everything that I would imagine in David's comments on the opportunity corridor are helping him and the city drive. It's the things that you know everything about that site and you have it all papered up and you have it on a shelf, which is here's our phase one and phase two. Here's our covenant not to sue. Here's our ge geotechnical and wetland surveys. We just did them a year or two ago. Here's our archaeological survey. God help us if anybody finds a, 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 you know, an arrowhead on a site. Nope, we checked that out. We used a, a, an archaeological firm about a year or two ago, got that papered up, we're fine. Uh, nobody has to call um, uh, SHPO. Uh, I think they're under a new name now. Uh, make sure you don't have any Indiana bats on the site. Do you have it written up? Is it understood that you have a, an, an endangered species inventory and that nothing will otherwise detract from a developer coming in and immediately starting to turn dirt once they get the necessary approvals. And Aaron, next slide. And that's me. So um, real quick, you know, that is all my comments are directed at great. You got the $350 million in state brownfield funding. Great. You use your, your million dollars of county allocated use. You got everything done up. It's nice. It's clean. It's remediated. Now you got to really get rubber meets the road of getting that site reused. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jeff and Sarah, David and Craig. Um, at this point, we can open up for an opportunity for questions. I want to kick off and start and see from each of you if um, in a nutshell, as communities are awaiting guidelines from DOD, um, what's the, the strongest piece of advice that you can give for how to begin tackling um, brownfield, getting uh, cohesiveness, setting a plan, prioritizing, what would be your one piece of advice that you could give from your experiences? Well, I'll, I'll start, but I bet you we all say close to the same thing, um, is uh, I think you have to be ready. And being ready, you just heard a lot of stuff from Jeff. Um, know your site or sites, um, the ones that are a priority, and that means involving other stakeholders. But to do a project and to have stuff, I mean, you're going to ask for money. They're going to want to know what's the money going to be used for. So again, to Jeff's point, you need to know the property. You know, can you get access to the property? There's going to be an element of match. Have you spent or other people spent money on that property over the last two, three, four years? We don't know how long they'll look and start collecting that information. But um, I didn't say this in the first Clean Ohio Fund because there was time. The one now is to, is to, is to just be ready and we could each talk an hour what that means but um finding your site and getting as much information as you can now is would be my piece of advice yeah i i can barely add to that except maybe maybe um you you want to pick a couple more sites than what you know you'll get for money uh so that you're queued up for the the competitive side of things uh and get Craig Casper or um, BRG or HCW, they all happen to be sponsors here today, um, but very good uh, environmental consultants who, who can help you thread through uh, what, what is a, a very complicated bureaucratic process um, and, and you, you need to be prepared to manage that. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I have anything earth shattering to add to that other than um, know your developers too. know, know what projects or people are looking at or what, um, you know, might, might have been kicked, had its, its tires kicked a year or two ago. And, and now with, with the new opportunity, um, somebody might dust it off the shelf and take a go at it. The only thing I'd add to all this too is know that the Brownfields money is not your only source of funds. So think about your typical sources and uses of funds table. Have everything else lined up. Um, I, I, I happen to be one of the team leads here at Bricker on your use of ARPA cash. 
And so it would your community want to be interested in using ARPA cash, you know, sidebar, yeah, you can do it. You have to be careful. But and what are your other sources of funds? Do you have philanthropic? Do you have federal? Um, line all that up as you prioritize which sites are the lowest hanging fruit. Thanks. That's great. And a site plug that um, our next webinar next month on, in the series will be um, inviting uh, folks from state and federal that have brownfield funding programs already that most likely will couple with the brownfield remediation fund in, in many cases um, through DOD, Jobs Ohio, EPA, OWDA, things of the sort like that. We did get one question in, um, do you anticipate a point-based scoring metric in the guidelines for the application process? I don't know if any of you have any insight into that. I personally have not heard. I, I mean, I assume yes, but you know, hard to say. Great. The, as we await the guidelines from the uh, Department of Development as they put out their rules and go through the process, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll know here in the next couple of weeks a little more insight into how the application process will work and, and how the funding will push through and things of the sort like that. Um, but we are almost at time. Um, I want to thank Sarah, David, Craig, Jeffrey, thank you so much um, for your time today. I hope all on the webinar found it um, educational and insightful. As I did mention, um, next month on December 7th, same time, 11 a.m., we'll have our second webinar in the series um, where we'll have OWDA, Jobs Ohio, EPA, um, the Department of Development to talk about current programs that are um, uh, available. Um, possibly grant, but loan programs as well um, that will likely um, fall into the toolbox that communities will utilize with the Brownfield Remediation Fund. Um, I did mention our slides uh, will be available um, online on ohiobrownfield.com, um, as well as the online directory the, that I have referenced and um, was emailed to many of you um, when it launched yesterday that will be updated on a monthly basis to help connect local change makers with um, experts uh, in the field as well. So with that, I thank everyone for your participation. I thank our sponsors and I thank our panelists for today and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hey everyone. <laughs>